Welcome back to the playlist on heme synthesis. So we're getting into the nitty gritty details of heme synthesis. In this video, we're going to look at one particular enzyme in the synthesis of the porphyrin ring system. And that's this enzyme shown right here. And this is not one whole name. In fact, what you'll find for this particular enzyme is there's three names. Okay, and those names are porphyrin deaminase, hydroxymethylbilane synthase, and preuroporphyrin synthase. Okay, um, the first name that's labeled as number one right here, porphyrin deaminase. This is a name that's given based on the mechanism of the enzyme. We're going to find out that the very first mechanistic step of the enzyme involves a deamination of a molecule we looked at in the last video called porphyrin. Okay, and it actually occurs via an E1 mechanism, a, a unimolecular elimination, which is very rare. We don't really see that in biochemistry, but it turns out that that's the, the theorized mechanistic step. The last two names sort of give you an idea of what you're going to, so the final product. Okay, so these molecules right here, hydroxymethylbilane and preuroporphyrin, okay, these are the same molecule. Okay, now preuroporphyrinogen is not the common name of it. The common name of the molecule that we're going to at the end of this reaction is going to be hydroxymethylbilane. So, but all three of these enzymatic names can be used. They all mean the same enzyme. Okay. So right here, this is basically the reaction that we're going to do. Okay. So we're basically going to have to condense four molecules of porphyrinogen to get this molecule over here, this beginning of the porphyrin ring, which has not yet been cyclized, which is called hydroxymethylbilane or preo-uroporphyrinogen. Okay, and notice right here, and I'll circle this in red just to make sure you understand this, is that notice how this particular precursor to the porphyrin ring has not yet been cyclized. So we can call it a tetrapyrrole because it is four pyrroles bound together, but we cannot yet call it a porphyrin ring system. That's why we call it pre uroporphyrinogen. So it's not yet a porphyrin ring. Porphyrin rings are completely cyclized, but this is a tetrapyrrole because we have four pyrrole groups um, covalently bound together, okay, although it's not cyclized. Now just keep in mind this that if we wanted to get one porphyrin molecule, remember that. Um, We've, we got porphyrin from delta amino levulinic acid, and the enzyme that took us to porphyrin from ALA was ALA dehydratase. So AL, ALA dehydratase. Another name for that enzyme would be porphyrin synthase, and that PB is not lead, that's porphyrin, so porphyrin synthase. And then if we wanted to get delta amino levulinic acid, we had to take one glycine. We had to take one glycine, and we also had to take one succinyl-CoA out of the TCA cycle. So keep in mind that to make one porphyrin, we had to have two delta amino levulinic acids, right, or two delta amino levulinates. So that means if we want to make four porphyrin, we have to have eight ALA molecules, okay? And to make one ALA, we had to have one glycine and one succinyl CoA. So, in order to make the four porphyrin engines needed to make the porphyrin ring system, that means we have to have a total, drum roll, of eight glycines and eight succinyl CoAs. Now, the glycines could very easily come from the diet, but keep in mind that these succinyl CoAs, they have to come from the TCA cycle. So, the synthesis of heme is actually pretty energetically exhaustive. To make one, you're going to have to sacrifice some energy from the TCA cycle. Okay, so you need eight glycines, eight succinyl CoAs, just to make this ring system right here, which is your hydroxymethylbilane or pre-uroporphyrinogen. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, let's actually look at the the subcellular compartments where this guy occurs. Okay, so this I know it looks like the ocarina from Ocarina of Time, but whatever. This right here, of course, is the mitochondria, okay, and in here, this is the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, the very first reaction that occurs in heme synthesis was ALA synthase, delta amino, excuse me, delta amino levulinate synthase. That process occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, but then delta amino levulinate is transported out of the mitochondria into the cytosol, 
and from there ALA is converted to porphyrmalinogen by porphyrmalinogen synthase, also called ALA dehydratase. And then from here, we're going to look at this particular enzyme right here, as we've already mentioned, porphyrmalinogen deaminase. And that's going to take porphyrmalinogen, condense four of those, and you get hydroxymethylbiline. So just keep in mind where, this, where these reactions are occurring. The ALA synthase occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. We transport that guy out, and then we do a series of steps up to coproporphyrinogen, and then that gets transported back into the mitochondrial matrix, and that's where we make the heme. Okay, so this is one of the pathways, like the urea cycle, that's going to span two subcellular compartments. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Now what we'll do is we'll actually look at the mechanism of portable engine deaminase. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the, the reason it gets the name porphyrmal engine deaminase is because the very first mechanistic step of this reaction is a deamination. And through considerable research, they've actually deduced that the first step of the mechanism actually proceeds by a unimolecular, unimolecular elimination. I'm going to do the mechanistic steps in green just so they can show it pretty easily here. Okay, so the very first step is this amine group right here, which really should have a positive charge, right? This amine group is going to just automatically leave as a leaving group. So it'll come out, abstract a proton from this base, and what you end up with is a carbocation intermediate, which the first thing that should pop into your mind is this, is that I have this primary carbon right here with a carbocation. And you, that should strike you as unusual because when you did organic chemistry, you never saw a primary carbon with a carbocation. And the question here is, is why, why on earth does that, why is it able to exist in the first place? Well, keep in mind that there's all of these double bonds right here that can move around. And it turns out that this carbocation right here is stabilized by the pi electron system of the pyrrole ring. And that's the only reason that that carbocation can exist. If you had a simple molecule, say, for instance, like propane, and you had a positive charge right here, you'd immediately get a hydride shift. Okay, so, you know, this is not a very stable molecule. Even secondary carbocations are not very stable. But the only reason this primary carbocation is able to exist is because it's stabilized by the pyrrole pi electron system. And in fact, um, what you can do is you can show the electrons moving around, and that's what actually leads to the increased stabilization. So, you know, carbon does not really like to have a positive charge. Um, those really aren't significant resonance contributors. But see, nitrogen can have a positive charge pretty easily. So what will happen is, is these pi electrons will shift around like this, and that ends up removing the positive charge from the carbon, and it puts it right here on the nitrogen, creating a shift base. Okay. And in fact, what we have now is an activated intermediate, and you'll see why in a minute, okay? It's activated because what we've essentially done is this carbon right here, this carbon, which is a CH2, right? We've made this carbon extremely electrophilic because the nitrogen, the shift base of the pyrrole, can now act as an electron sink. Let's look at how that works. But before we do that, um, we need to get a feeling for... Um, the active site of this enzyme, porphyrmalinogen deaminase. This enzyme con contains a very odd coenzyme. It's called the dipyrrole coenzyme. And it's unusual because in order to make this, you essentially have to condense two pyrrole molecules from porphyrmalinogen. So these two guys, they're not actually going to be in the final product. See this guy, this guy, they're not going to be in the final product, but they are made from porphyrmalinogen and they're covalently attached to the enzyme, porphyrmalinogen deaminase. Okay? but they are made from porphyrmalinogen. And so what you have to do is you have to polymerize the porphyrmalinogens onto this coenzyme, okay? Let's look at how that happens right now. So what's gonna happen is the base that's newly deprotonated in the active site will deprotonate the pyrrole ring right here. And that will essentially force these electrons right here, this bond to break, and it will come over here and nucleophilically attack this carbon right here because it's increasingly electrophilic because this nitrogen right here can act as an electron sink. So the pi electrons rearrange back to their normal positions and what you end up with is 
another pyrrole group added onto the dipyrrole coenzyme. Just to remind you, this part right here, this component right here is the dipyrrole coenzyme, okay? It's synthesized from porphobilinogen, but it doesn't get incorporated into the final product. It's just used to polymerize the rings, okay? And what's essentially going to happen with this enzyme is this process of unimolecular elimination and condensation. This is going to happen four times, okay? So once again, we're going to, we're going to allow another porphobilinogen into the active site. And once again, we're going to do a unimolecular elimination. Of course, we deaminate it. That generates a carbyl cation. And then we form this activated intermediate where the nitrogen can act as an electron sink. So once again, there's going to be another base in the active site, the same one. And what's going to happen is, see, so do the mechanistic steps in green. This is going to deprotonate this carbon of this pyrrole ring. And then you'll, of course, get nucleophilic attack on this carbon right here because it's increasingly electrophilic because the pi electrons can rearrange and the nitrogen can act as an electron sink. In fact, it acts as an electron sink very similar to the way something like NADP works or NAD or something like that, okay? It's working the exact same way. Also with FAD and FMN, so just keep that in mind. And once again, in doing this, we polymerize it again and we get this guy. So just remember that this right here, this is the dipyrrole coenzyme that's on the enzyme covalently. And now we've con condensed two pyrrole rings onto this coenzyme. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna do it two more times, two cycles. So this right here, this is the third cycle, unimolecular elimination followed by an addition reaction. And then we do the same thing again. This is the fourth cycle, unimolecular elimination and an addition reaction. Until finally what we get is this nasty looking molecule which is the hexapyrrole intermediate. And the reason it's a hexapyrrole is because, number one, we have the dipyrrole coenzyme right here. And then the remaining ones, this is the third pyrrole, this is the fourth pyrrole, this is the fifth one, and then, of course, finally, this is the sixth one. So it has six pyrroles on it. Therefore, you call it the hexapyrrole intermediate of porphobilinogen deaminases mechanism. Okay? The final step of this particular reaction mechanism is we have to hydrolyze off the dipyrrole coenzyme, okay? And the way this is accomplished is by use of water. So this is actually gonna be a hydrolytic mechanism. Okay, so what's gonna happen is a base is gonna deprotonate water as it enters the active site, and the effect of hydroxide is going to, and let me do the mechanism of in green again. So the base deprotonates water and the effective hydroxide attacks this carbon right here and that effectively splits off the dipyrrole coenzyme and puts a carbanion on this particular carbon of the dipyrrole cofactor and that's specifically the second pyrrole okay so what you end up with is something like this and then to regenerate the resting state of the enzyme this uh, lone pair right here is going to re-abstract the proton from the base and then what we effectively do is we create number one the dipyrrole coenzyme which is still covalently attached to um, porphobilinogen deaminase and then what we also get is hydroxymethyl bilane. Um, after that particular me mechanistic step is over right here here is the dipyrrole coenzyme that's the dipyrrole coenzyme and then the final product that we really care about is of course hydroxymethylbilane or we call it pre uroporphyrinogen and if you want to be really specific about this particular pre uroporphyrinogen you can call it pre uroporphyrinogen 3 because there's multiple there can be multiple porphyrinogens okay this is just the third one just like when you whenever you do uroporphyrinogen 3 decarboxylase you'll get coproporphyrinogen 3 so this 3 is actually really important if you want to be absolutely specific because there's mul multiple uroporphyrinogens and multiple coproporphyrinogens okay so this guy right here this is your final product hydroxymethyl bilane so the last thing we need to do in this video is talk a little bit about what happens if you have a deficiency of this enzyme because what's actually 
um, somewhat common, not super common, and not super rare, um, somewhere in the middle. Um, you can have deficiencies of enzymes in this pathway. In fact, there's a known deficiency of all the enzymes in heme synthesis. Okay? All of them except deficiencies of ALA synthase, they're called porphyrias. Okay, so a deficiency, oops, let me get the brush, a deficiency of an enzyme in this pathway with the exception of deficiencies of ALA synthase, that's called a porphyria. Okay, and it turns out that a deficiency of porphyrin deaminase, it's the second most common porphyria, and you essentially call it acute intermittent acute intermittent I don't know if I'm spelling that right acute intermittent porphyria okay and basically what ends up happening is if you have a deficiency of this enzyme porphyrin ends up accumulating in the cytosol because remember what this enzyme is doing is it's effectively getting rid of porphyrin Okay, and these intermediates in, or these you could call them substrates in heme synthesis, you don't want accumulation of these guys because they can cause toxicity. So, deficiency of porphyrinogen deaminase is called acute intermittent porphyria. It's the second most common porphyria, and so in the cytosol where this enzymatic reaction occurs, right? This is the cytosol out here. Okay. Porphyrin accumulates in the cytosol because you can't clear it. Now, what this particular porphyria does is um, it usually results in less of the enzyme. There have been cases noted where you have um, basically mutations in it, but overall you just get less of the enzyme. And so if there's less enzyme, you have a deficiency of the enzyme based on the number of molecules of the enzyme. And so either way, um, the molecule porphyrin is going to accumulate and it's going to cause toxicity. Okay, So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on the synthesis of hydroxymethyl bilane. Okay. In the next video, we're going to look at the reaction mechanism and physiology of uroporphyrinogen 3 cosynthase. And after that, we'll look at uroporphyrinogen 3 decarboxylase. See you in the next video.